I hope you can see my slides uh, and I hope we'll have uh, a conversation uh, this morning. Um, I would like to start with uh, a definition of open science um, and um, now we have uh, an internationally recognized definition uh, which was included in the UNESCO recommendation um, on open science, uh, which over 190 governments of the world supported uh, and which became the first international policy making in instrument uh, on open science in November last year. And open science there is defined as uh, a process that makes uh, scientific knowledge openly available, accessible and reusable for everyone. Open science uh, increases scientific collaborations and sharing. Uh, and uh, it opens up the process of knowledge creation. Also the process of knowledge evaluation and uh, knowledge communication to everyone um, in um, the society. And uh, when uh, we talk about uh, open science with uh, early career researchers, uh, usually there are various like you see on the slide. Uh, how do you do I explain open science to my uh, supervisor if uh, he's not practicing open science himself, for example, herself? Uh, and uh, if I practice open science, uh, would it be more difficult for me to publish my research? There are so many flavors of open science. How do I actually uh, start? So these are all uh, um, common questions and issues, and uh, I will try to address them um, in uh, my talk today. And uh, I hope we could also discuss it with you. I really like uh, this uh, overview of uh, how students could uh, practice open science at different uh, stages of their research, from conceptualizing research to designing research to doing analysis, uh, reporting the results, uh, disseminating research. Uh, and uh, as you see, open science has a lot of flavors and uh, you can practice all of them, but I don't know a lot of people who are really practicing all of them because it really depends on uh, on the discipline. Uh, but you can start practicing some of them and uh, see how it works. So open science is really uh, an opportunity, and it's up to you to decide uh, which opportunity and which uh, area you pick. Um, first way of uh, practicing open science is actually talking about open science like uh, we are doing. Uh, and uh, there is uh, an international movement which is called uh, Reproducible Team. And uh, it's a format where students, uh, researchers uh, get together and discuss over tea or coffee different aspects of um, open science and uh, how that could be beneficial to careers or what the issues are and how we, those issues uh, could be addressed. So one way of practicing open science is just talking to, to other students, to other researchers uh, about uh, issues of uh, reproducibility and open science in your research. Another way is to think about your project workflow and project could be your research or any any other project uh, that you're doing and uh, thinking how, how you organize your folders, structures, file folder structures, uh, how do you name your documents, do you use any naming conventions, uh, how do you control versions of uh, your works? Uh, which cloud storage you use? Uh, and all other details related to organizing research. Uh, 
It's also about uh, choosing who can actually access your project results uh, and workflows. Is it just you or is it you and your PhD supervisor, for example, or your co collaborators or maybe even general public? And when they can access it? Is it uh, immediately? Is it at um, some stage in your research? Uh, and uh, it can be done uh, at any stage or it can be done uh, when you already have your published results, for example. So it's really up to you to decide. And here, uh, a good tip is to think about uh, reuser perspective. So if we look at the very end of the research cycle, which says reusing, then uh, what data organization would a reuser like? And that reuser could be you three years later, for example, if you want to go back to, to your previous research and see how you did certain elements, what would be the best way to organize your work so that future you or any other researchers who might be interested could have a look and uh, really understand. So having clear file folder structures help. Uh, it also helps when uh, you give uh, meaningful and consistent file names to your files. So, for example, uh, you could use uh, year, month, date. Try not to use uh, strange characters. Uh, to try to give clear names to files, for example, if you worked with uh, specific instruments and file name name could be project instrument location date which is like year months date and then the file um, and um, this would help you when you're doing research now and it would also help you if you want to go back to the results of your research if you need a space to manage uh, all that, uh, Open Science Framework uh, is uh, a good tool uh, for project management and uh, it's, uh, it's a free and open source space where you can create your project. Uh, so as you can see, authors of the articles that I quoted earlier created a space for the project which is right in this article and you can see people who are participating in this project uh, and uh, you can upload files here you have wiki functionalities and you can really manage who has access it could be uh, just closed access for you or it could be a group of your collaborators or it could be a public page like like this one open to anyone so it's one of free tools that might make it easier for you to manage your project workflows. Another aspect of open science is called pre-registration. And um, the idea behind pre-registration is to announce that uh, you are studying this research. You can um, specify your research plans and um, you can uh, again either keep it to minimal description uh, to the public or you can uh, already provide a lot of details uh, about your research and it's a way to tell the world that you are doing this research uh, so that others wouldn't be duplicating or maybe if there are people doing similar research uh, you can just join together and uh, work to make it uh, really faster and uh, collaborative. Um, and the way it works, uh, it uses same open science framework. Uh, so you sign up, create an account, uh, and then uh, you start 
pre-registering your research and uh, you just write your title, description, uh, design plan, sampling plan, uh, describe variables of your research, uh, describe your analysis plan, uh, and then you Also add subjects to make it easier to people to search for for your pre-registered research, uh, and then you you publish it and uh, make it available. And uh, it's a way to tell other researchers that uh, this research is ongoing and um, they should keep an eye on it. Another aspect of open science is called registered reports, and um, this is more common for psychology, but um, it could also work uh, in other research areas. Uh, and um, registered reports are opportunity to get feedback and peer review during the research process. So how it works uh, when uh, when you have your research idea, when you have your study design, you basically make your study design available, and then uh, uh, it, you collect feedback from uh, reviewers. It's almost like when when you're writing your master thesis or PhD work when uh, you present your research plan to your supervisor and you discuss it in a group. So that's that's almost like that, but it's it's a public discussion. And then after you start collecting and analyzing data, you write a report. And uh, that report would be published uh, in a journal. It's not a journal article yet because it's just a report after this initial stage of that data analysis. But there are a number of journals uh, that uh, have this type of publication in addition to journal articles. It's called registered reports where some results are pre-announced and feedback from reviewers is collected. Another way of uh, practicing open science is to share preprints. And when we talk about preprints, they basically uh, Completed uh, authors' manuscripts for potentially a journal article, but uh, they might not be submitted to a journal yet, or they might be submitted to a journal, but uh, you're, you're still expecting feedback from reviewers. So preprints are not peer reviewed yet. They completed uh, from, from your end. But uh, you you are still waiting for for the feedback from uh, from the community from reviewers. And why uh, researchers go for preprints? Because that's an opportunity to claim your priority to really announce that you have these results. You completed your study, and you are sharing it even before it publish. And. Uh, there was an interesting study that showed that um, articles, like articles which are already published in journals, get uh, 66 percent more, uh, so, sorry, 36 percent more citations uh, if uh, they were made available as a preprint before they were published uh, as a journal article. So it's really uh, a chance to to get more citations. It's also an opportunity to receive feedback and uh, improve your manuscript. Um, and uh, it's kind of proof of productivity because uh, unfortunately the problem is that uh, publication chain is very long now. So now time between article submission and article publication is the longest ever. And sometimes it might take a year or even two years to publish your journal article. And uh, you can't really wait with, with, with that if you if you really want to announce your, your research results. Uh, so that's why researchers go for preprints. Uh, 
to claim their intellectual priority. And in COVID-19, uh, almost all the research funders actually required researchers working with COVID-19 to make their findings available as uh, preprints. And there was an interesting observation that uh, those preprints were usually shorter than uh, all other articles before, and they were revised more often because there was a lot of feedback and, and discussions uh, around preprints. Uh, so it really helps to establish your intellectual priority. Journals don't mind if you make your articles available as preprints. So most journals nowadays have really preprints friendly policies. Of course, you, you need to check that with, with a journal where you want to publish, but uh, in general, journals support preprints. And uh, there was also an interesting study about preprints in uh, biology that uh, two thirds of preprints that appeared uh, on BioArchive were published as journal articles within two years. And uh, those published articles were not really very different from preprints that were deposited. So preprints were really very good, high quality. And what's also interesting is that uh, many journals allow preprints transfer directly from uh, preprint servers into journal articles. And uh, some like eLife, they even use preprint plat platforms as submission platforms for, for their journal articles. And some publishers just go to preprint servers and uh, check and then invite uh, authors to submit preprints to their journals. Of course, when we talk about preprints, it's uh, it's really important to stress that they uh, when preprints are communicated, uh, they uh, are clearly labeled that it's uh, it's a research that hasn't been peer reviewed yet that uh, results of the work shouldn't be overhyped. Uh, and um, if there is a journal article, then usually um, a link to a journal article is posted next to the preprint on a preprint server. And uh, I'm from Ukraine and uh, Ukrainian uh, mathematician uh, Marina Vyazovska received uh, this year Fields Medal, which is in mathematics like a Nobel Prize. And uh, she received the research which she made available uh, on a preprint server archive. And she did that in uh, 2016. And her article describing those research results published was published a year later in 2017. But the moment she posted her results on archive, she already received acclaims and uh, other mathematicians started citing her. So basically she, she became uh, famous not when she published her article in the Annals of Mathematics, but when she just posted her results in um, preprints repository archive, because that's that's how mathematicians and also people in high energy physics and uh, similar areas basically start their day. They they go to preprint archive and uh, check what's new in the field. And uh, preprints also give uh, you as a researcher an opportunity to control when your results are released. So you don't need to wait for years until your research is published. So you can really make your article available when you feel comfortable and uh, you can start receiving valuable feedback and attention from other researchers. 
that's an interesting uh, case uh, on the slide. Uh, so a researcher who you see submitted uh, a journal article and it was still undergoing a peer review, but she worked with collaborators and her collaborators received, uh, decided to submit another article describing her research, research that they did together. And because her article hasn't been published yet, she needed a way to uh, reference her research in that collaborative research article. So she basically posted a preprint, she wrote this digital object identify DOI that she could include as a reference uh, in um, the other articles that her collaborators was publishing. So it's really um, a good way to reference a preprint and a manuscript that is still going review in one journal in another publication. Then that's that's an interesting case. Uh, this researcher uh, received uh, when he posted a preprint, he received uh, an inv invitation from a journal editor to publish uh, an article in uh, that journal. And when um, that article was undergoing review, he received another invitation from another open access journal to submit uh, that preprint as a manuscript to, to the journal. Of course, he didn't because he was already publishing with another journal, but uh, as you see, journal editors are really checking um, preprints archive. Uh, also, if some articles uh, include the results that would be immediately used and reused, like uh, this article, which was about a software, free and open source software code. Uh, the article itself was still undergoing peer review, but uh, people already started using uh, software outlined in the article, and uh, they received uh, citations to preprints and uh, also fellowship applications. Uh, because they were recognized as uh, good researchers in this area. Of course, uh, the decision to make preprints available um, is a decision that uh, you should probably discuss with your supervisor, mentor, collaborators. But uh, as you see, for example, in this Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry. It's a policy that um, research results are made available as preprints uh, because uh, it's an opportunity to reach out to diverse audiences uh, and also an opportunity to receive uh, immediate feedback and also improve your article. Uh, that's another testimony that uh, the moment preprint was posted and researcher shared information about this preprint on social media, she started receiving uh, questions and uh, that article was also about uh, software. So people already started testing her code that she made available. Some students also upload their master thesis as preprints uh, because a preprint could be a journal article, but it could also be any other type of research. And um, this researcher from Beethoven University of Technology made his master thesis available and uh, he, uh, he saw that that master thesis was downloaded 100 times which is probably not bad for a master thesis, which uh, isn't used uh, a lot. It's, it's not a journal article. And then another testimony is that uh, a researcher was uh, looking for a job and um, when he submitted his job application, uh, he mentioned that he shared his research results uh, as preprints and uh, that was 
a major factor why he was actually hired because um, people who were hiring could really see that uh, he is practicing science according to the latest developments and practices and he's studying as assistant professor even before his article is published there. As a buyer has a lot of uh, additional support materials about uh, preprints uh, in the preprints info center and they also keep a directory of uh, preprint servers in different disciplines and also publishes policies uh, regarding preprints. Another topic uh, which is uh, related to practice in open science is uh, research data management. And uh, when we talk about research data management in uh, universities research context, uh, we usually talk about data management plans, which are documents describing uh, how data will be collected for your research, uh, whether it will be closed, open or shared. And um, it also outlines uh, how you will be uh, preserving that data if there is a plan to provide long term preservation to your data. So usually a um, structure is that uh, students have to or any researcher has to describe uh, data types used in the research, uh, in which formats the data will be stored, uh, ethics and uh, intellectual property rights issues related to research and data, access policies, data sharing and data reuse approaches, uh, how data will be st stored short term, and then uh, where the data will be deposited somewhere for secure long-term preservation. And there are free and open source um, data management tools, a number of them, DMP Online or DMP Tool or Argos or uh, Data Sharing Wizard or Data Wiz. So really, really a number of them and uh, they all include uh, templates, and many universities already introduced the requirement to write data management plans. And uh, you might check with your university or if you receive funding to do your PhD or to do your research, then most likely funders also have certain requirements about data management plans. And <laughs> they also have some templates that um, could be used for that. And uh, data management management will really help to make research easier, help to save data for later in case you want to reuse it. Uh, and especially if you want to share data, then um, it helps you to think how you will be sharing data. And then like, like with preprints, uh, it will help to get your credit for collecting this data. Uh, avoid acquisition of fraud or bad signs. And uh, like I mentioned, a lot of funders now require data management plans and also a number of institutions. Uh, and it's really aligned with uh, good practices in doing research. Uh, uh, some researchers are saying when um, a journal article is published, it's almost like an advertising. It's almost like a poster because uh, if you can't see the data, you can't really verify research results. And it helps to cut down on academic fraud. There was this famous case um, in the Netherlands when uh, there was a researcher in psychology who was saying that uh, people who eat meat are more cruel than people who are vegetarian. And uh, he was like really publishing articles, but then his PhD student actually caught him uh, that he was falsifying his data. But because journals where he was publishing never asked him to show the data, no one 
could really check whether data are real or not. And uh, of course, when uh, this uh, scandal became a scandal, he, this, this researcher was stripped from all his privileges and uh, it's now a requirement in, uh, in the Netherlands uh, to have data management plans for research and uh, also provide access to, to data associated with the article. Another famous case was uh, in the UK when uh, there were strict uh, austerity measures uh, in uh, a number of European countries, uh, in the UK, in uh, Spain, Portugal, uh, Latvia, and many others where international monetary fund was saying that uh, countries are not really performing well and uh, that special measures should be introduced to start savings and uh, people should be fired from jobs because uh, there is not enough money to support all those jobs created. So, so all these scary stories. And um, decision was based on a report and the report was based uh, on uh, a research and that research had an arrow in the spreadsheet and no one noticed that uh, arrow and um, harsh political decisions were taken based on uh, a study that uh, wasn't wasn't the right study that, that has this arrow and if people could see the spreadsheet with calculations and if they could notice that arrow in calculations, maybe countries wouldn't suffer so much. And then uh, speaking about citations, uh, there were studies that confirmed that uh, research articles that also made uh, data available are cited uh, more often than research articles that uh, don't make data available, so it's also an opportunity to receive more citations. So, and the right number of economic benefits. Uh, so you can see a slide from the US about NASA Landsat satellite images, uh, and there were similar studies uh, in Europe for European Bioinformatics Institute. So really this open data sharing uh, brings back to the economy a lot. And um, a data which is shared really reaches out more people and have greater impact and uh, it helps to avoid duplication of efforts and uh, helps to preserve data for future generations. And um, as with uh, open science practices, that there are different flavors of open science practices, there are also different levels of openness. Uh, so data could be uh, open for access, use, sharing, reuse. Uh, there could be a shared data which isn't open by default, but could be shared uh, under specific conditions. And um, that's the case, for example, for many COVID-19 uh, related uh, research and developments. Uh, so pharmaceutical companies, for example, are saying that uh, we're not sharing our data openly uh, used for vaccine development, but if uh, a researcher wants to see the data, then that researcher could request access to data and that access could be granted. But then, of course, uh, data could also be closed and uh, closed data is usually sensitive data or personal data or, or if there are some uh, commercial uh, interests that would uh, prevent data being opened. Uh, and, uh, in the data management plan, researchers usually describe whether data will be made open or it will be 
share data on the specific provisions or data can't be open at all. And uh, I like this five stars of uh, open data model because open data could also have different levels of openness. Uh, and it was suggested by Tim Berners-Lee who developed web. And uh, a one star open data is when uh, data is available on the web under open license. Two stars is when this data is uh, made available as structured data, for example, Excel file instead of a scan of a table. Three stars when uh, non proprietary open formats are used, for example, CSV instead of Excel. Four stars when data is available in a resource that has uh, unique resource identifiers, for example, when data is available in the repository with a unique link. And then five stars is when this data is linked to publications, for example, to a published journal article or to US research or to your, your other research when this data is provided in a context. And usually when funders talk about data, they uh, talk about um, data which is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable and like I said it could be not open data but uh, a data which is well described and uh, there is a way to request access to it. So usually when uh, research funders or institutions introduce research data management policies uh, they require um, preserving and sharing data needed to validate uh, results in scientific publications. And that's really minimal requirement and it's a good practice for you. If you use data in writing your journal articles, then make sure that you save the data because journals might ask for it even years after publication. Then uh, data descriptions, uh, who created this data set, uh, title, year of publication, repository, etc. If this data is made uh, available. And uh, if you use uh, a repository to store your data, then you don't need to worry about standards for description because usually those repositories will uh, help you with that. There will be some templates. Uh, and repositories usually assign uh, unique identifiers uh, to your data, which makes it easier to link to other research outputs. It's also a good practice if together with data you share some documentation, how you collected this data, and also if uh, you interviewed uh, humans, uh, it would be good to make informed consent uh, forms together with uh, data. And then if there is a specific software needed to actually work with the data, it's good if that software is also made available or at least there is a description which software was used. So basically the requirement is that uh, it's better to save and share if possible everything needed to replicate results of the study and everything that could be potentially useful. And um, of course, if we talk about uh, reuse and uh, replications, then uh, it's better if it's open data, open code and software and well described open workflows. Um, and that's an important moment that uh, even if data sharing happens later on. If you only share your data, for example, when you publish your journal article or when you submit your journal article, you have to think about data sharing when you start your research uh, because uh, you need to think about personal data and, uh, and uh, was it really necessary to collect it? Uh, because maybe in some cases, uh, a need to collect personal data is not so high 
and uh, maybe it's easier not to collect any personal data in your studies uh, because then it would be easier to share the data. But of course, even if, if there is a personal data collected, then there are anonymization tools and uh, a number of free anonymization tools like Amnesia that could be used to anonymize data. And um, informed consents when you start doing your interviews or surveys or questionnaires uh, uh, should include this provision for sharing data later on because people whom you interview should agree not only for you to use data in your research and publications, but also to make um, anonymized or pseudo anonymized data available later on. So this data sharing is something that you should think when you start your research. And uh, like with preprints, uh, it's not only your decision, it's a collect collective decision because if you have some collaborators, they should also agree on your data management approaches. Uh, research participants, we already discussed it. Informed consents. Uh, if you have some commercial partners in your research, uh, they shouldn't be against data sharing, or if they are against, then uh, you can deposit your data as closed access data, but you can't share it. Um, and then um, if you want to use a disciplinary repository, that repository might have some uh, specific uh, workflows. So you might check uh, what are data repository polish policies. And now a number of publishers uh, started requiring data availability statements. So if you're already know in which journal you would like to publish your research, uh, please check what is the data policy of that journal. And then, of course, uh, requirements of your institutions and your funders. Uh, and um, I would like to stress these two differences that uh, depositing data is just uh, an act of uh, basically storing the data for long-term preservation and depositing doesn't does it necessarily mean uh, enabling access to everyone. It could be closed access just for you and you're the only person who can access their data in, in this repository, but everyone else could access descriptions of your data. And giving access, uh, sharing or publishing is uh, is an act when you enable access to this data deposited, when you deposit it as an open data and an open license. Uh, and you can use uh, disciplinary repositories for depositing data for your domain. Or you can use uh, an institutional repository if your university has one uh, or a national repository and uh, there are also free and open source software repositories and tools like shared repositories Zenodo for example which any researcher could use uh, for free to deposit data and uh, RIS3 data is uh, a very good resource where you can search for data repositories available in your discipline or in your country. And um, I mentioned uh, that uh, most journals already require data availability. And uh, there are different scenarios how journals might be requiring it. So some might say, um, when you submit your journal article, please also send us your data set so that we could uh, verify your research results. Some publishers are saying the data should be deposited in a trusted repository, and uh, then publisher just needs a link where this data is available. Uh, or some publishers might say that uh, we're not requiring any uh, data from you now, 
but uh, we might be requiring at a review stage here and uh, please be aware that reviewers might be asking for your data. So please uh, go to the journal website and check uh, their data archiving policies. So this is an, an example of uh, Open Research Europe, which is a publishing platform of the European Commission. And um, they have uh, a data availability policy. They follow this approach uh, as most European funders follow. Data should be as open as possible, as closed as necessary. And uh, when uh, articles are submitted, then um, they should either include a link to data which is available in a repository or an explanation why your data isn't available. So, for example, if you're under specific obligations to protect the results, like obligations of confidentiality or security or obligation to protect personal data, then uh, you just uh, say that uh, data is not available uh, under open access because of those specific concerns. Uh, and they have a very detailed page here how the data availability statement uh, could be added to your article. And like I said, many journals are requiring now this data availability statement together with um, journal articles. Some journals also publish uh, so-called data papers and uh, data papers are something in between of uh, well-described data set and uh, a real journal article because you might uh, still be in the process of your research so you don't have a published article yet but you already have some results um, that you would like to share as a data set so data paper is usually uh, a data set made available together with uh, descriptions, which I mentioned how data was collected, uh, how it can be reused, what potential value that data ha uh, has. And um, there are universities uh, and funders who consider so-called data papers are as important as and as valuable as journal articles. And uh, usually when we talk to researchers about data sharing um, and data reuse, they're a bit skeptical. They're saying, uh, like, fine, I will, I'll, I'll make all this effort to describe my data, or make it available, but will people actually use it? Sir? And uh, to address these concerns, we try to collect some use cases how data was uh, reused. Sir. So, for example, this researcher, he uh, he's from the School of Geosciences, and uh, he was saying that um, he created uh, climate mapping research data, and for him it's a lot easier to just share this data once in a repository than keep answering tons of emails that he receives from other researchers to provide this data, so it really saves time for him when uh, he makes data available. That's an interesting case. Uh, uh, this researcher was collecting songs and stories from uh, people living in uh, South Sudan, and he was doing that as part of his uh, linguistic research because he was a late linguist. Uh, and uh, when uh, he made his data openly available, then uh, he saw that uh, other linguists were also looking at, at, uh, at this data, not linguists studying the same language, but even, even other linguists. Uh, then, uh, because it was about uh, traditional languages in Sudan, uh, people in Sudan were using his data set because for them it was a way to better understand their own language, which was disappearing. It was uh, uh, tribal language. 
And then uh, he was very pleasantly surprised when uh, songs that he collected were used as uh, background music uh, in uh, in a documentary. So he he saw a lot of surprising ways how his data was reused. Another example is from marine sciences, and uh, there was a group of researchers who was collecting uh, information about fish species living uh, in certain area. And um, another group uh, reused that data, which they made available to process it. And then a third group of researchers produced their maps out of uh, that uh, fish species data. And what's interesting is that uh, the data set of fish was used uh, and cited, cited in journal articles uh, 2,578 times, which is, which is a lot. And they could track that because uh, a data set was made available uh, with a uh, unique identifier. And then uh, the data was used to create uh, climate change mapping, which is like completely different application from studying fish, uh, but it was all possible because of uh, open data sharing. And uh, another example from uh, marine floats, when there was a group of researchers uh, collecting the data and then Another group of researchers standardize that data, of course, acknowledging original groups that collected data and then released uh, a data set uh, mentioning all involved. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, software lab notes and models could be reused, uh, and um, it's an opportunity to be involved in new exciting projects and receive more citations. Um, and here we're moving to another flavor of open science, which is uh, reproducible code and uh, open research software. And um, some of you might be saying uh, that uh, I don't really work with code and uh, why should I care about reproducibility? It might be really hard. But uh, it seems so because uh, a lot of software that you're already using might have already built in functionalities to produce rep reproducible, reproducible code. For example, those working in statistics, uh, SPSS statistics or JAPS have some uh, ways of uh, making the data reproducible and then of course there are specific uh, software packages like Python, MATLAB or others uh, that some researchers use in doing their research. Um, and uh, just a note, I think that uh, working with open source is uh, a lot more exciting and rewarding than open with closed source. For example, in my research, I always try to use uh, free and open source software because it's an opportunity to learn from the community and also bring back the community. The most traditional uh, practice of open science is uh, open access publishing. That's probably one of the oldest open science practices. Uh, and uh, here there is a common misconception that uh, all open access journals charge article processing charges and they're expensive and uh, it's it's not a way to go and um, that's that's only a mis misconception because uh, if we check uh, directory of open access journals and uh, we can see that out of uh, over 18,000 journals 12,592 don't charge any article processing charges. Uh, of course, it might be the case that uh, a journal where you would like to publish, a journal in your area of research, charges an APC. 
And then in that case, uh, maybe you can still uh, publish in a subscription based journal like. If it's if it's if it's a journal that uh, publishes open access articles and closed access articles, open access articles could only be published if you pay. If you don't pay, then this article is closed access. Uh, journals might uh, allow making uh, published articles uh, available in repositories, not in the version as it was published, because unfortunately, not many subscription based journals allow depositing final publishers PDFs, but uh, as a version that was approved for publication, your final manuscript after peer review. And uh, that's maybe a strategy that you can take that uh, your journal articles uh, will be made available either as journal articles uh, published in open access journals if there are no costs attached to that or as uh, manuscripts uh, available in repositories and um, there is uh, a database of publisher policies called Sherpa where you can check uh, what your journal policy is regarding uh, depositing uh, your accepted uh, article versions uh, in a repository. Some might say that uh, they allow to do this immediately, some, some might say that there is a six months embargo period, sir, but still this embargo period is is better than nothing, no access at all. And uh, that's another tip uh, that I would like to give you. Try to keep that version of the article that you approve for publication. So it's called uh, Authors Accepted Manuscript because um, in many cases that's the only version of the article that could be made uh, available in a repository later on. And you can still uh, export that version of uh, article from uh, publisher submission systems or uh, even after publication, but uh, some publishers allow doing that only within a month, some say within a year, so it's really better. The moment you approve your article for publication, just save that version as the final author's manuscript. And um, that's a policy that I take uh, when I publish my research. Uh, so I, uh, for, for journal articles, I publish in uh, open access journals that don't charge article processing charges. For book chapters, uh, I publish with uh, book publishers that allow making uh, book chapters available in a repository. And that's uh, one of my book chapters uh, that was published in, in a book that was sold, but uh, a publisher allowed uh, depositing that book chapter immediately and uh, it received uh, some views and downloads there. Uh, I think that's that's a good result for me as an author. Another interesting flavor of uh, open science is uh, open peer review. And of course it depends uh, from your research area, but traditionally um, when uh, journal articles are reviewed, neither authors know the reviewers, no reviewers, no authors. So there is a so-called blind peer review. Open peer review tries to challenge that and um, open peer review says that uh, um, why don't we disclose identities of authors and reviewers? So there is this open identities approach when uh, names are known. Another approach is when uh, review results are published uh, next to the article and everyone could read it. And Open Research Europe, which I already mentioned, uh, this publication platform of the European Commission practices this open peer review approach uh, because they believe that uh, it enables more open and uh, transparent 
conversations um, and it also improves the quality of peer review. So how this publishing platform works? Uh, only researchers who receive funding from uh, the European Commission could uh, submit their journal articles. And when the article is submit submitted, uh, it undergoes some editorial checks, uh, for plagiarism, uh, for ethics, data availability statements, etc. And after that, after those editorial checks, an article is made available on the platform. And um, it's made available as not peer reviewed yet. And then peer review process starts uh, and um, reviewers uh, are known to everyone. And also the review reports are made public. So you can see an example of uh, an article which uh, is still awaiting peer review. So everyone can read this article, but it's clearly labeled as not peer reviewed yet. This is an example when um, reviewers whose names you can see already submitted uh, their review reports and they suggested revisions. Uh, and um, there is a next version of the article which includes uh, feedback from reviewers. And um, this next version of the article uh, is available. Reviewers reports are available. And also there is an explanation from authors how this second version of the article is different from uh, the first version of the article before peer review. And uh, it's almost like a conversation that you would have at the conference discussing your research results. But here all these discussions are happening in this online journal space. That's another example of an article which was approved uh, without any request for re revisions. So you can see that it's it's only available in, in one version because uh, there were no changes. Uh, and uh, I had I have some experience with uh, open peer review, and I can say that of course it takes uh, an effort to write a review report which is uh, made available together with a journal article. But uh, it's really rewarding because I, I was reviewing for this article that you see on the screen and uh, another reviewer and I uh, suggested some revisions and also uh, included our names in uh, acknowledgement section of the article because it really valued the feedback that uh, we gave them. And I hope what I described uh, answers this misconception that uh, open science is mainly pain with little gain, that it costs time and uh, maybe for nothing. But uh, I can reassure you that it does take some time, but it's really rewarding because if you pre-register your research, it helps you to consider issues that might arise later on. If you have a data management plan, it allows you to make right decisions when data is available uh, and then uh, it helps you to identify open source tools uh, that uh, you can use uh, that would make your research easier and then uh, like I mentioned more and more universities hire researchers that have experience with open science so it's also an opportunity for you to receive a good job in uh, good progressive uh, lab and it's also a requirement mm -hmm. of research funders for example uh, European Commission now says that when uh, researchers describe their research experience before they had to list five publications five journal articles now the form was changed and uh, a funder requires to list uh, either journal articles or widely used data sets or softwares or any other achievements, uh, not necessary journal articles. And open science is really an integral part of uh, research proposal. And if you mention your five 
journal articles, then uh, they should really be open access articles um, and uh, all future articles uh, arising from, from your re research should be made available immediately upon publication in a repository. And um, the funder doesn't really look at journal impact factor, they only look at the value of um, your research, yes. and the value of your article. And uh, they have some mandatory open science practices like open access to publications, uh, fair data management, uh, and they also have some uh, recommended open science practices like involving uh, citizens uh, and communities in your research, sharing uh, software, pre-registration, registered reports, preprints, uh, providing access to other research outputs and also participation in open peer review is one of the recommended open science practices. And uh, national governments are introducing similar policies. For example, Latvia has a new open science policy that uh, includes open access to publications, fair research data and citizen science as a way to open up science and um, research. And uh, we're starting a new campaign, which is an open climate campaign, where we encourage researchers working in the area of climate change and biodiversity to make their research findings available as preprints, publish uh, in open access journals that don't charge, uh, make articles available in repositories, make data open, uh, try to share code that they use uh, and um, Open Access Week, which is an international event uh, celebrating every year in October, has a theme open for climate justice. So when we're thinking about open science, we could also think about how open science could really help addressing all these issues of uh, climate change. Here. And uh, these are some of the actions that you might take as a researcher if you want to practice some aspects of open science um, and um, there is also an international network of uh, researchers interested in open science. Uh, it's called Open Science Communities uh, and they are a group of researchers uh, talking about open science and advancing open science in their institutions uh, and they started in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, open science communities are now in every Dutch university, but this movement is also growing to other European countries. So that's that's an opportunity for you to have this community uh, and uh, keep talking about open science. So thanks a lot for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have, hear your thoughts. Uh, and we could also do an exercise uh, because I think the way you sit, so uh, you, you could have conversation in pairs. So I don't know how how we are doing in terms of time, but if if there is some time, maybe we can spend uh, it uh, having conversations in pairs. Whether you already practice open science, which aspects of open science. Are there any aspects that you would like to start practicing and need more information? Uh, so now I'm open to, to any form of questions, discussion uh, or discussions in pairs. Thanks a lot. Irina, thank you very much for your comprehensive uh, overview of open science topics. Uh, many topics of these will our students here uh, learn with other lectures more in detail or in uh, use cases, uh, how to use the open science principles. So thank you very much again. Uh, do you have some questions for Irina, perhaps? Yes, please. I have a question from data repository. Uh, can you hear me well? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. You mentioned uh, various data repository platforms where researchers can store their data, various formats like open or semi-open data. My question is about the review process. 
when the reviewers check, evaluate, and see whether the data that was uh, that is available uh, and that matches with the results in the preprint, how does that influence on the application process in terms of the timeline? Because if it's also about the, the reviewer's capacity. If, if there is a lot of data available and then the reviewers have to dedicate sufficient time. The process to the peer review process. Mm -hmm. if, okay. if in comparison, uh, I don't know if you understand the question, but if in comparison to the traditional publication process, is this data validation process in the open access journals for the reviewers who work there, uh, is it like a significant amount of difference for the publication process in general as a result of how? Thanks a lot for your question. Thanks a lot for your question. Sorry, there is some echo. I hope you you, you can hear me well. Um, we so yeah, it's uh, it's a good question, uh, and. Um, I don't know because uh, I only have experience reviewing one article that didn't make data available, and uh, that that was uh, my comment when uh, when when I was reviewing that article, uh, and I'm still waiting for for the process to share data. But I guess it's uh, it's also about. Uh, doing uh, a real review because uh, if I if I already agree to review a paper and provide some feedback to an author, if I don't see the data, then uh, my feedback might not be as valuable as, uh, as it should be. And these are not only open access journal publishers that require data availability. Subscription based publishers are requiring that as well because um, they want to make sure that uh, research they publish is real high quality research uh, and is not a research that will be reflected late, later on, like uh, the works of the, the Dutch professor. So it's it's a challenge, but I think it's an opportunity to have better science and better research in the end. Uh, and when we talk about uh, depositing data in repositories, um, repositories usually don't review data, so they really they they trust you as a researcher. It's it's your responsibility to. make to provide well described data and I manage a uh, COVID-19 community on Zenoda and I see a lot of uh, research data on COVID-19 that is shared on Zenoda and I wish uh, that data would be described a little bit better because uh, usually researchers just uh, write a title of the data set, uh, then um, they make the data set available, but they don't make uh, supporting documentation available. And then uh, it's really hard for, for other researchers, or even for reviewers to figure out uh, what what kind of data is, is there and how, how to, to understand it. Uh, so it's uh, it would be a good practice if uh, researchers would make a little bit more effort uh, describing their data better, because data which is shared in repositories isn't uh, peer reviewed. And then yeah, it's it's a challenge for when we speak about uh, journal articles reviewers 
to also review data sets. Okay, thank you, Rina. Another question? Will somebody uh, tell us something about these questions that Irina put us? Do you have already some experiences in open science practice? Yes, I have. Yes, please tell us. Yes, I'm third year PhD student in clinical psychology at the uh, University of uh, Youth Host Lawrence University at Budapest. So um, as a PhD student, after finishing every semester, we have to upload our uh, research um, uh, project, which we uh, update or uh, we progress. Uh, so uh, thank you so much uh, because uh, um, as a beginner, I didn't know what is this. I just upload uh, in open science and uh, uh, thanks to you that you clearly defined how can we use it. So uh, my question is that, uh, um, uh, so what, uh, what is the next process? Like uh, I uploaded my uh, research uh, proposal and um, next step uh, so far what I did. So uh, like for publication and uh, uh, my question is, uh, I'm a little bit confused as uh, for data uploading uh, in terms of uh, copyright or something like that uh, when other people uh, will uh, uh, get this uh, information. So is it uh, safe for us? Safe. And um, I, I don't know what you used, uh, like was, whether you pre-registered your research uh, already using this uh, registration page. Apologies for the yes. scrolling. Yes. Yes, we registered our project. So you, you used uh, you use this template already, right? Yes. To pre-register. Yeah, that, then I think if if you if you did that, sir, then um, you what what else you can do? Maybe you can uh, have your project page uh, on Open Science Framework and include a link. Uh, like in the description, for example, you can in include a link to pre-registered, so, yeah, even here, there is a link, uh, registrations. Yes. So just link your registration with uh, your project page. And on this project page, you can um, keep adding uh, links or even files of your data management plan and also links to journal articles when, uh, when they are published. So it could be a good space for you to manage your all your research process. Thank you. Another, please. Yeah, thank you, Irina, for your uh, lecture uh, and for all the practical tips you gave us. Yeah, I really like that a lot. And uh, my question is about like science communication. Like, do you have um, experiences or know people that use social networks or blogs to then uh, even communicate their postings in repositories of reprints? Like, yeah, do you have any examples of that? How that works? And if, yeah, if it's suitable or not. Thanks a lot for your question. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, that that's another effort uh, that uh, researchers should take now because it, it's not enough. Uh, like even if you publish your research in uh, in the very best journal in your research area, there are so many other research articles published on the same day or the same week or the same month that it's um, if you really want to be noticed then um, a good way is to keep LinkedIn 
as professional uh, account and also have um, a Twitter account where you can um, report about uh, the research that uh, you do and share all the links uh, and that would be communication to professional audiences, uh, communication with other researchers, uh, and I don't know, and, and also actually communication with uh, journalists because media usually check Twitter for other types of communications uh, in um, in your country because most likely your Twitter will be uh, in English and then in in your in your language if your language isn't English. But there might be some um, some other spaces where people communicate research. So, for example, um, in Ukraine, uh, Facebook is really big and uh, is almost used like like internet. There, so researchers are also share updates about their research or their Facebook pages um, and there might be some um, specific communities for topical discussions. Uh, so for example, I mentioned uh, climate change and uh, there is a community in Poland which is uh, promoting science in climate change disc discussions. And it's a web space, uh, it's a forum, uh, and it's also a real like in-person discussions forum. So if, if there are similar communities uh, in your research area in, in, in your country, maybe that's that's also a good way to, to join them and be part of those discussions. Um, but it's yeah, it's 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 a challenge. I can try to find there was a very good link how to use social media for communicating research. So I'll I'll try to find it and I'll, I'll share with uh, the summer school hosts and they hope so they will share with you. Thank you. Another question? Yeah, Sarah. May I just ask what is based on your opinion the biggest downside of open science and where is biggest space for improvement dealing with open science from us as um, young uh, researchers and from society as the ones who are reading our researches? That's, that's a very good question. So one downside is that uh, it takes time because you might be spending this time to actually do your research, but you, you'll be spending it to document your research. Sure. And um, I have some colleagues in Ukraine who published uh, a data paper. They were, oh, they were also working in the area of climate changes, <laughs> and uh, it actually took them a month to describe the data properly, make it available in uh, in the right formats. And of course, they they were not doing this every day within that month, but it's just there. Uh, it's a significant amount of effort there. Uh, and uh, they also had to put this as a responsibility of one of the researchers, uh, so you, you you really need someone to to drive this moment and, and uh, allocate some time and have enough knowledge to do that. So another challenge is actually where do you get that right knowledge? Uh, so I think ideally all uh, researchers should have training uh, provided by the universities on um, how to practice open science, so it could be part of standard training that researchers receive. And then there should be some support available in uh, universities to do that. Uh, so, for example, um, in um, Ukrainian universities, there are no 
data librarians or data stewards who could provide that kind of support. But there are, in the Netherlands, for example, there are. And maybe uh, if my colleagues were in the Netherlands, maybe they as researchers wouldn't need to spend so much time to make this data available, but uh, they could have asked for help from from a data steward. So that's another strategic decision that universities should take. They should allocate uh, people at the library or people at research departments as data support data stewards uh, to help researchers. And then uh, another disadvantage, or I don't know whether we can say was this a disadvantage or not, like a missed opportunity, I would say. So imagine um, if there is a call for postdocs on a certain area and uh, postdocs that have experience with open science will be um, will have preference than researchers who don't have experience with open science and that's a little bit unfair because uh, as I mentioned there are a lot of Western European countries already have support structures in place. So chances are that uh, Western European researchers would be much more advanced uh, in open science than uh, Eastern European researchers or Southern European researchers, uh, which uh, is a little bit unfair because it's not it's not researchers fault that they they're not advanced in open science. It's kind of institutional fault that uh, they support uh, wasn't available uh, at the right time. And that's another reason why researchers should be investing, like, like you were investing, you, you came to the summer school to, to, to learn more about open science because yeah, unfortunately that's, that's an investment in, uh, in the future career, which is I think a good investment uh, in the right time because uh, open science is becoming a mainstream in Europe and it's it's good to be prepared and equipped for that. Thank you. Another question? No. You, you. Actually, her question was really good, so I just... Okay, <laughs> change your mind. Yeah. Okay. The uh, preprints, because I'm really interested in that one. Like for how long the materials will be available in in the preprints? It's the first one, and then if there's a way for us to remove the data, like for for example, like what I said before, it's not review. So if, for example, you find some faults in your data uh, unintentionally, and you want to remove it, is there a way to remove it? And the third one is like. Uh, if you're able to finally publish your paper, what will happen to you? Thank you. I'll, I'll answer your second question because the first I could... is uh, uh, for how long the materials will be available. Your materials in the future. For how what, long what, what what kind of material? Like for so, your manuscript or your data or result. In the how long it should be available. Mm -hmm. So usually um, platforms that um, are used to share preprints or data allow versioning. So what you would do, like, like I showed uh, that uh, European uh, publishing platform Open Research Europe, there is uh, an original submitted article, original preprint. If uh, if there is an updated version of that preprint after peer review, then uh, it's made available as uh, second version of the article. And uh, on the first version, there is a clear indication that uh, this is not the latest version of the article. Uh, there is a newer version. Uh, of that article and uh, a reader is redirected to read the latest one. And similarly for data, for example, Zenoder uh, allows you to upload uh, new versions of your data or any other material. 
And then when uh, someone is on your previous version page, there is also a notice at the top that there is a newer version available and just click on it and um, access it. Uh, so usually those original versions are not removed, but a newer version is added. And when um, all these versions are used in uh, indexing services, for example, Europub Math Central, which is uh, a search engine for life sci sciences, uh, and also a repository for life sciences in Europe, uh, they started indexing preprints, and they have um, a software that checks for updates. So for example, if they indexed uh, preprint version one, and there is a preprint version two available already, they have a way to check for newer versions, and then also make those newer versions available first in, in, in the search results. Uh, so this versioning uh, works really well for reprints and data sharing platforms already. OK, please. Yes, so I just thought the question. Um, <laughs> does open science include uh, a free access to all journal databases and free publication of papers? If no, what is your opinion about uh, charging for the publication of works in some uh, uh, big, big uh, journals? <coughs> For your question, um, so I think um, open science should include also free discovery tools and uh, open availability of uh, articles that you read. And I, I didn't uh, include that uh, in uh, in my talk, but uh, there are tools like uh, Unpaywall, which is a browser extension. Uh, that you can um, install. And then when you are on the journal article, which says you don't have subscription to the journal article, you have to pay to read it, you can um, click on uh, the Sun Wall extension and it will check whether there is an openly available article of uh, oh, whether this article was made openly available by researchers, for example, in the institutional repository. Or there is an open access button which uh, works in a similar way. Yeah. So you you have to you can also have it as you can use it on the web, or you can have it as as an extension, and uh, it will check for openly available versions of this article, or it will email an author saying that uh, you would like to have access to this article because you don't have subscription could and also email you this article. So there are some developments uh, around that. Uh, and to answer your, your second question about charging for publication, uh, I think it's, it's not fair to charge for publications because uh, Even if there are money in the project to pay for publications, there will never be enough money because usually research projects produce a lot of research results and a lot of publications and uh, you can't be paying for, for every publication and uh, some journals are really ridiculous, like Nature charging $11,000 for a journal article and that's that's probably that's that's more than a researcher salary for a year in Ukraine and that's that's not fair I think uh, but luckily um, UNESCO recommendation which I mentioned uh, specifically stress that uh, open access should be provided in uh, equitable way and everyone should uh, make an effort to provide open access to journal articles without asking authors to pay. And uh, 
there is a large movement uh, to support uh, non APC non article processing charge charges and journals in Europe. Um, and, uh, there will be some activities to strengthen um, institutional journals because usually institutional journals don't charge article processing charges. And then also, in addition, uh, there is a big research assessment reform going on in Europe. I already showed uh, you Horizon Europe requirements, which say that we don't care where you publish. So we're not looking at the journal where you publish, we're looking at your research article. And similarly, universities started saying that um, they want to reward and uh, promote researchers who publish openly, who share their data, and um, data sharing is as important as uh, journal publishing. Um, so different approaches should be valued. And some universities are even saying that maybe you can you can still be promoted even if you don't publish. If you're if you're a good lecturer, maybe uh, what you're doing as a lecturer is even more important than uh, you trying to publish three articles a year. So it might be a requirement in in some institutions because not not every researcher is good in writing. A researcher might be a brilliant researcher, but writing is, is a different skill. And uh, universities are moving away from this push to publish, push to publish in high impact factor journals and um, trying to give room to everyone's talent and say that just be good in what you are good. Just think what it is that you are doing that is really good. Focus on that and we will reward you for for this because it's it's more important than uh, you trying to do a million other things with not so high quality. So I think these are really interesting times when there will be a lot of changes in, in the way universities function. Another question? No? No. no. OK, yes, please. Did you hear the comment, Irina? I, I, I'm sorry, the sound was breaking. Was it about research gate? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's that's also an important decision that you can take as a researcher, because uh, research gate or Academia Edu are commercial platforms. They uh, let you share your papers, but they uh, sell uh, services based on your papers, on the papers that all researchers share, and they are not sharing the profits with researchers who contribute their content. And um, I think they could close the system any day they want to. They also sell uh, advertising based on uh, your research uh, content. Uh, and I, I'm not saying that you you should be. You should stop. Uploading your content on ResearchGate or Academy, you know, because like you said, it's really a space where a lot of researchers uh, check the content. 
but you, you should you should also be mindful that uh, there are other non-commercial platforms that you could use to share your research and uh, you could make your research available in your institutional repository and uh, it will be even uh, more visible than uh, research on research gate because uh, there are specialized discovery tools uh, or academic content that uh, will pick your article and will uh, spread it over and uh, include in, in, in the discovery tools and uh, research gates uh, aren't included. Uh, and uh, institutional repositories or subject repositories are usually public entities uh, and uh, they they're not selling your content and uh, they they are not charging for services there uh, so my my decision is not to share my papers on um, research gate or academy do but share them on in order and uh, yeah, hope that other researchers will pick them up there because I, I believe in services of public institutions there. But I'm, I'm not I'm not a real researcher like I'm, I don't I don't need to be promoted. I work for a non governmental organization. Uh, so my, my choice might be uh, different from 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 your choice okay thank you irina we have, have time for a last question oh irina do you have one yes please thank you i'm i'm Teodora Bekati from the first and i uh, work for a smaller journal at the first uh, in the field of pedagogy and um, and we are trying to you know just uh, make steps forward to uh, on one hand to the like you know uh, recognizement from boss and scopus and other uh, databases but also uh, open science is an important thing for us and i realized while uh, i was um, um you know, getting information of um, of uh, how to become a journal of uh, Scopus, for example, that uh, there are some aspects or uh, criteria that are um, not compatible with open science, or or it, it can be um, you know, contradictory. For example double uh, blind peer review is uh, many times it's a criteria for for uh, being um, voted um, a journal but uh, for example if we would like to uh, uh, work uh, hopefully openly for our scientists and uh, and for our readers maybe uh, open peer review would be a better solution and also, um, I'm um, I'm interested in uh, your opinion. I don't know whether you have experience with that, that uh, field. That, um, uh, for example, are there any uh, criteria that journals can uh, ask for or provide for their authors? For example, in data management or or other fields that can facilitate uh, joining, um, you know, the world of open science. I don't know if it was clear. Mm. Thanks a lot for your question. Um, so I think a good way for, for a journal to assess um, where a journal is now, if it's an open access journal, uh, to check requirements for indexing in um, Direct in the directory of open access journals because uh, they have policies uh, and expectations uh, towards open access journals. Uh, and uh, I think they include everything now except 
data availability statements, or, but they mentioned some examples of data availability statements from, from other journals that they consider good in my slides, and I'll, I'll email my, my slides to organizers to, to share with you. And about contradictory criteria, I'm not sure because I know that um, Open Research Europe is published by F1000 and they are providing um, this kind of publication platforms to different founders outside Europe as well. And uh, they have some journals indexed in uh, Scopus and they they use they only use open peer review they, they don't have it's it's not an option it's it's a must and they index in scopus uh, so maybe it's something for for the web of science maybe web of science uh, requires blind peer review but like i said uh, you can you can be practicing open science without practicing open peer review because uh, open peer review is just one one aspect and uh, it might work well um, for for some journals or for some areas and uh, there might be some disadvantages uh, for others and one of the disadvantages for example uh, early career researchers and uh, female authors uh, so we we've seen a number of studies that uh, usually uh, Unfortunately, there is a bias towards to, towards female authors, and there is a bias towards early career researchers. Uh, so some reviewers, the moment they see that it's the author is just studying, or the author is a female, they might be uh, patronizing in, uh, or they might be subjective in uh, in the way they review this paper. But then on the other hand, if if their review results are made public, then uh, they would think twice before disadvantaging or before criticizing uh, too much uh, authors only because of their age or because of, of their gender. So I think my, my, my main message for today is uh, to, to say that uh, everyone will be practicing open science in a different way. And it's really up to you to decide what is your best open science strategy, what what would work for for your journal, what what are other practices in in your area. Because I I have some limitations. I'm a social scientist, so I understand that area a little bit better than, for example, education. But it's it's important to have this kind of strategy. And it's important to identify some steps. Uh, so maybe open peer review could be a step for you in three years time when I'm sure every indexing system will include that as, as an option um, 